And one little caveat here is when you get your blood test, especially when you're in the, the Midwest or Northern states, you wanna make sure your blood test, you get that at different times of the year. So if I get my blood test, you get your blood test in, let's just say February or March, mm -hmm. going through winter, not a lot of sun here. Okay. We're gonna probably have lower vitamin D levels versus if I get my blood test in August. So to me, when I'm getting my physical, I try to get, I try to stagger that. One year I get it in maybe February, the next year I might get it in August, and I just okay. compare apples to apples. And I want to make sure everybody, all the listeners understand, on our website, this handout we have, it's everywhere, it's called Know Your Numbers. So again, for those of you who can see this or not, but you just go to our website, one of the downloads is Know Your Numbers, and make this really simple today. If you can't remember anything or you're not going to listen to this podcast through the entirety, is you just take this into your doctor and say, these are what I want. I need to understand what these numbers are. And many of these are not going to be on a typical blood test. Right. And so that's why we was like, hey, make this simple. You just give this handout to them. So when I show a slide of this to groups, I'll talk about medical literacy. Yeah. You know, hey, how many of you got your glucose tech before? Yes. Cholesterol, of course. Hem homocysteine. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, hey, what's that? So homocysteine, there's no medications for it. If you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. But homocysteine is oxidation marker. And it's one of the greatest predictors of having a heart attack. Really? Especially for women. Really? So, again, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. And that's crazy how they don't tell you that. And it's the most important. So all you do is just ask for it. I want to get my homocysteine checked. Ideally, you want to see homocysteine less than 10. Less than 10, huh? And what lowers homocysteine or oxidation welcome back to another rusty move podcast and today um back by popular demand i have rashawn and we're going to do part two of uh your health keep score i was listening to a little bit today just kind of review what we did last time but before we start, um, anything happened in your world that you want to share with anybody? You just did the founders video. Yeah, I thought that turned out great. That was great. Yeah, we um, well, last week was it two weeks ago? We talked about it. Yeah, well, it's all done now. Uh, we're probably gonna post it online. As of right now, uh, we brought down that forty-minute video to four minutes, and then we got a one-minute video. So it turned out great. Yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. So. It was funny that I was looking at some of the. I don't know where you got Matt. Must have got him. Found him somewhere, but. Um, I had these baggy clothes on and, you know, way back in the day, I got the long <laughs> hair and, you know, that's probably 35, I don't know, probably when I was in my early thirties, maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, it took me back in time. I'm like, where did you guys get this stuff? <laughs> so I thought that was fun. You know, what's happening in really? Michigan right now, we're kind of going through a drought, which I've never really seen in my lived here my entire life, but we we're up in Northern Michigan this past weekend and they closed the uh, I-75 um, for mm -hmm. almost two days because of the the fire and the um, the smoke. And so it's been really interesting. Mm. You know, you hear about the California fires, and here we are in Michigan. And on our lake, at Douglas Lake, which is about 15 miles from the bridge, um, the it was a beautiful sunny day, but it yeah. was all, like, smog almost because of the fire wow so, so it's it like all pretty much yeah done. you just couldn't it wasn't clear at all and you're mm. like gosh this is crazy that i've never seen this before so mm. anyway we're hoping for rain um i think sometimes around the country we're looking at some of these things but um i thought that's interesting from you know what's going on from a weather standpoint uh what's going on at ontario living we got um we got our new uh cod liver oil gel tablets so those are in so those are great for traveling Oh, yeah. I never thought I'd see that in my time here, but no, it's, we're really excited about that. And then the kids' cod liver oil comes in, I think it's next week or the week after. Um, traveling coming up, we're doing some events. And as I mentioned before, we're doing live events here at our headquarters. We had one yesterday. We have a, quite a few coming up. So if you're out there and you're interested in bringing your team in for a half day, full day, multiple days, we do that. And um, I think we do a really nice job of that. So um, that's kind of the front end on that. So. We talked a little bit about this before, so if you haven't listened to this, um, two weeks ago we did the first segment of your Health Keep score. Today is all going to be about your numbers. But if we go back, your body's always talking to you. That was our segment. It has nothing to do with blood work. But the 10 components we discussed, 
mm-hmm. is imagine cruising down the highway and the engine light comes on. Mm-hmm. I think we all hope the engine light goes off. So that's our body. So if we have acid reflux, mm-hmm. you don't take a Tums or a Prilosec, you're like, okay, something's not a whack or yeah. if my sleep's broken or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. And the 10 areas are eyes. Number two is teeth and gums. Number three is breath. As I mentioned to you before, breath is going to be your future diagnostic tool. So again, we we know a lot about breath. What's you know ketosis, or you're doing breathalyzer for alcohol, or the list goes on. Yep. Number four is sleep. So if you're not sleeping, I think everybody has occasional poor night of sleep. But if your sleep's consistently poor, something's not right. Yeah. And then number five is digestion elimination. And that's a, the bulls, B-U-L-L-S. So that's bowel, urine, lymph, lungs, and skin. Yeah. So if those get out of whack, if you have skin issues or you're having a problem with the bowel movement, moving too fast or too slow, or the list goes on. But, you know, we talk so much about digestion in today's world that really elimination shows things very quickly. So you don't have to get crazy into the weeds about doing all sorts of microbiome testing. You just look at how people are eliminating. Mm-hmm. And then which I was talking to a group yesterday we had, and we were talking about energy. I said, it's, it's interesting that people truly believe they can't get through the day without a pot of coffee or an energy drink. Mm-hmm. And so the group yesterday, they, were, they had some really good questions about that. How do I build my energy, and how do I protect it? And mm-hmm. that's really a thing we ought to ask this, uh, yourself is, and again, I remember asking you, and you said your energy is like an 8.5 to a 9, so most of your energy is coming from food or how we breathe or what you said in your morning um, rituals is yeah. your grounding and how you sunlight and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, mm-hmm. And then we go into number seven, which is your muscles, tendons, connective tissue. So if your knee's bothering you, your back's bothering you. And for example, for me, I had hamstring issues for a long time. Mm. And I went to see um, my physical therapist, Jill Marlin, which I've talked quite a bit about. And she said, you know, it's not a hamstring issue, Chris. you got great flexibility. It's because your back doesn't have that uh, mobility flexibility, and so it's a little bit out of sync. Mm-hmm. So you don't have the right communication. So when things start speeding up, hence your hamstrings aren't firing in the way they should be. Yep. So, again, I, I knew I had a problem, but I didn't quite know what it was. So, And then we have our bones is eight. Skin, hair, and nails is number nine. And body weight is number 10. So those are... Anyway, those are the, what we talked about in the first um, Your Health Keeps Score segment. And in this segment, we're going to talk a lot about blood work. And I want to make sure everybody, all the listeners understand, on our website, this handout we have, it's everywhere. It's called Know Your Numbers. So again, for those of you who can see this or not, but you just go to our website. One of the downloads is Know Your Numbers. And make this really simple today. If you can't remember anything or you're not going to listen to this podcast through the entirety, is you just take this into your doctor and say, these are what I want. I need to understand what these numbers are. And many of these are not going to be on a typical blood test. Right. And so that's why we was like, hey, make this simple. You just give this handout to them. So, so if you're taking notes or just notes to self, I want you to start with this. You need to understand what your risk is. And so before anybody puts you on a medication – you got to start understanding your, your risk. And again, medical literacy has never been higher. But what do I mean by that? So if your blood pressure is too high, your cholesterol is out of balance, you got to understand what is your risk. So before you start going down that path, and I always like to talk about this. Did you know that the number one drug in the world today is still cholesterol med? So mm. stat meds are lower cholesterol. Multi, multi-billion dollar industry. It's crazy. And when about 60 to 70% of people that have a heart attack have normal cholesterol levels. Hmm. So cholesterol is not the beast that everybody's been taught. Hmm. And so when you talk to people about cholesterol, and again, getting into the weeds too much today, we're not interested in that. But what I'm interested in is just basic understanding that cholesterol is essential for life. Yeah. That's why they don't test cholesterol for pregnant women, because it will be so high. Hmm. And so when people think about cholesterol itself, I think most people believe they want to lower cholesterol. Mm. And if my cholesterol is lower, they're actually proud of it. But in reality, cholesterol is amazing. It makes every cell in the human body 
transports vitamins and minerals. And the big one is it trans it, it builds your hormones, stress yeah. and building hormones. Mm-hmm. And so if you think of cholesterol being something you want to lower, what you want to make a note to self is you want your cholesterol level higher. Believe it or not, you want it higher in balance. Mm. And that's the big takeaway in the cholesterol piece is you want your cholesterol to be higher in balance and you will basically live longer and you'll be more thriving. Okay. So, so step number one is we have to understand cholesterol is absolutely amazing in balance. Now, how do you know that? So on our Know Your Numbers handout, we have this thing called cholesterol to HDL ratio. So many people think of HDL and LDL as good and bad. In reality, is they work together as a team. Yeah. So they're not one better than the other. They work together in a team. But one of the ratios you want to look at is a cholesterol to HDL ratio. So imagine if your total cholesterol is 240, you probably might walk out of that doctor's office with a prescription medication to lower it. When in reality is you don't know your risk. So if your total cholesterol is 240 and your HDL is 80, mm-hmm. you divide the 80 into the 240, and that gives you a HDL cholesterol to HDL ratio. And so for women, you want that number to be 3.5 or less, and for men, 4.5 or less. So if your cholesterol is 240 and your HDL is 80, you have a ratio of 3.0. In fact, you'd be thriving with that type of cholesterol profile. So what if it's higher or lower? So you want your cholesterol profile or your HDL cholesterol to HDL ratio to be lower. Okay. So if my HDL, if my cholesterol is higher per se, Mm And my HDL is in that that range. Your cholesterol now is higher in balance. Okay. And so that's what you're looking for is that simple number of what your cholesterol to HDL ratio is. For women, 3.5 or less. And for men, 4.5 or less. So that's the big takeaway here. Mm. Again, we could spend all Breaking day talking down. about cholesterol, good, bad. We have a whole podcast just on cholesterol itself. Yeah. I'm just, tover- I just want to make sure everybody's like, I'm getting my blood test. This yeah. is what I basically need to know. And the second piece I want to understand, too, because these I, when I put this together, I put these in little buckets. You can see this. Yep. They're little squares. So this is what we're looking at right now. We make this really simple for people because we don't understand this stuff. And why would we have not been taught this? Mm-hmm. But the second one is your triglycerides to HDL ratio. And triglycerides, cholesterol profile takes a little while to move, maybe three or four months. But triglycerides will move very quickly depending mm-hmm. on your lifestyle. And as I mentioned before, when you're talking about teeth and gums, you can't lie to your dental hygienist about your flossing. So you can't, hey, Rashawn, how's your, how's, your, how's your flossing going? Well, I'm doing great. And then all of a sudden they floss. Oh, yeah, and all type of stuff over, right? in your teeth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so right, right, right. when you think of triglycerides, that's the same analogy yeah. with flossing. It will change very quickly. You can't say to me you're eating healthy or not drinking too much alcohol because triglycerides will show up very quickly. Mm. So triglyceride to HDL ratio is another one. So if your triglycerides are 100 and your HDL is, let's say, 50, you're going to have a ratio of 2.0. And ideally, mm. you want to have 2.0 or less. Or less. Yep. So if your triglycerides are 100, under 100 and your HDL might be 80, you might have a 1, which is fantastic. So when I'm looking at people and I'm talking to their doctors. I'm looking like, hey, look at your cholesterol to, to HDL ratio. That's mm. great. And my triglyceride HDL ratio is great. I have very little risk. So then you could talk about particle sizes and fibrogenin, and you could find calcium scores. You can do all sorts of other testing. But before you go down that path, you need to just get the basic stuff. Yeah. And if you get the basic stuff, nine out of ten times, you're going to be great. And this is the conversation you want to have either with your health professional, because the more you get in the game, the better dialogue you're going to get. Right. And the better results you're going to get. And, and you'll be able to know what you're talking about. Too. Yeah, you, you, you now understand how to do that. So today's, right. today's podcast is not about exactly what to do to lower it, improve it. We have all sorts of that, – that could be all day talking yeah, about that. That's a side mission. <laughs> so in my, in my, when I did the audio book, I was looking at this. Yeah. This was an hour and 20-minute Know Your Numbers so it was a long time, but I talked Crazy. about what they were, but also what to improve on that. But these are all can def- all these numbers can be improved by changing your lifestyle, what you eat, doing the superfoods, getting enough rest, breathing yeah. outside, all that kind of stuff. So, okay. but today is more of like, oh, I need to learn more, know a little more about that. That's the point, because 
I cannot tell you how many people I work with on a consistent basis or teams. And I don't want to go too into the weeds because there, you know, they, there's a lot of information here. But the big picture stuff is understanding the human body's amazing its ability to heal itself. Work with your health professional. Ask better questions. And then be more informed in this space. Yep. And this is chapter 30, 30 and 31. The Know Your Numbers is chapter 31. But this gets all into the weeds here. So, again, step number one, really simple. Understand what your risk is. Number two, we go into the cholesterol. Understand cholesterol is amazing. And then get understanding the what you're looking for with the cholesterol to HDL ratio. Yeah. And then the triglyceride to HDL ratio. And that's all you need to know. Then from here, the second category we're going to go into is glucose, and that's type 2 diabetes. Hmm. And so I had an event yesterday, and this guy was a type 2 diabetic, been a type 2 diabetic for 10 years, and he thought you can't eat carbohydrates anymore. Can't eat fruits, didn't eat the oatmeal on the run, which you mm, love. Yeah, that's good. He wouldn't eat, and as soon as I knew, saw that, I'm like, hmm. So when I started talking about carbohydrates and fruits and making your body more alkaline and gut health, he was told that he can't eat carbohydrates because he's a type 2 diabetic. Someone told him that? His doctor told him that. So the, the sad piece about wow. that was, and he's on a cholesterol med and he's on that, but the point of this is that we had to back up and say, okay, I know you have these beliefs, but when you think of the cell... The cell's the disease of type 2 diabetes. Once the cell gets stiff and rigid, it's hard for when you eat a food, your glucose goes up, and it's hard for the insulin to open up the cell. The, the cell is rusted. Okay. So it's like a rusty lock on the door. Mm. And so if the, the uh, door is rusted, it's hard for that cell to be opened up, and so hence now my glucose goes up, which leads into type 2 diabetes. And today, you know, the numbers are staggering. You know, almost one in five, one in six in the United States have type two diabetes, and that's trending to one in four. Wow. So this trains off the tracks. Multi, multi billion dollar industry. You see the medications they advertised every night on TV, along with the, the weight loss medications today. But yeah. people, type two diabetes is a disease of the cell. It's not a disease of carbohydrates. You can wow, eat that's... fruit. As you make the cell soft and permeable, your glucose, and that's why not only type 2 diabetes is preventable, but it's reversible. I had a gentleman not too long ago, and so when you're thinking about glucose, you want your glucose to be ideally less than 95, and that looks over your glucose over a period of day. It's like the stock market looking at for a day. Your A1C is a number that you're looking at your glucose number, but it's over a period of time, 6 to 12 weeks. Okay. And so that's really the big number is your A1C, and that number should be 5.6 or less. So I had a good, really close friend of mine come up for tra come down from Traverse City, and he type 2 diabetic and decided, you know, enough's enough. I need to change this. So he came down with his wife, and he changed, ch changed his whole lifestyle. Mm. And his A1C came right back to normal. And so you're like, oh, this is – and people don't have never been taught that, that, hey, this is reversible. Absolutely. Yeah. It's preventable and reversible. So just if you feel like you're going down the path, and again, even if you're a type 1 diabetic, that don't, you don't produce insulin, that can be improved upon because your body's going to be more sensitive mm -hmm. to open up the cells. So again, think of your glucose and A1C as a really good predictor of you know future health, but Diabetes is a wrecking ball. Type 2 diabetes is a wrecking ball for the mind and the body because mm. it goes after every vessel in the body. And it's very, but as the cell gets healthy, that's why we're such a big fan of cod liver oil because cod liver oil makes that cell soft and permeable. Mm. So again, that's the, that's the point on when you think of diabetes, look to your right, look to your left. Somebody's a type 2 diabetes, has type 2 diabetes in the United States, and it's getting worse, and it's directly related to our lifestyle. Mm. Then we move into... So, again, glucose is looking at your, the stock market for a day. Hemoglobin A1C looks at the stock market for 6 to 12 weeks. And then we move into two numbers that I think most people are not familiar with. So when I show a slide of this to groups, I'll talk about medical literacy. Yeah. You know, hey, how many of you got your glucose tech before? Yes. Cholesterol, of course. Hem homocysteine. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, hey, what's that? 
So homocysteine, <laughs> there's no medications for it. If you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. But homocysteine is oxidation marker. And it's one of the greatest predictors of having a heart attack. Really? Especially for women. Really? So, again, if you don't ask for it, you're not going to get it. And that's crazy how they don't tell you that. And it's the most important. So all you do is just ask for it. I want to get my homocysteine checked. Ideally, you want to see homocysteine less than 10. Less than 10, huh? And what lowers homocysteine or oxidation is antioxidants. So you can see when people take carbohydrates out of their diet, they're not eating fruits and colorful vegetables That's and things like that. Yeah. Your homocysteine goes up. Mm. So when you look at the keto diet or high protein diet, low carb diet, you're going to see rises in homocysteine. Mm. And so that's what I see with more and more people. They come in, I already know when I get their homocysteine that it's that's 15, crazy, 18, man. 22. I had one woman that was 34. That tells me right away they're not. And the number one way, a way to lower your homocysteine level is folate, which is greens. Mm. So you be all, all grass, green diet or what? Well, yep, anything green. Kale, spinach, broccoli. Anything high in folate is going to lower that colorful fruits and vegetables. So anything that oxidizes turns brown, like if I bite into an apple, that's oxidation. It turns mm-hmm. brown. Yeah. So anything that's live okay. and starts to rot, that's going to lower your homocysteine. Are right, you talking now? I help you all taking notes. I'm over here on the podcast taking notes. <laughs> so, so imagine if you're eating mostly meat yeah. or you're eating processed foods, you don't have any, there's no antioxidants. So your homocysteine is going to go up. Mm. So I eat meat. But the goal is understanding that protein is essential, but too much protein can actually increase oxidation. Hmm. So that's called an amino acid. So acid levels go up, oxidation levels go up. Hmm. So, so again, we're, not, we're, we're just trying to educate people like, hey, make sure you get your homocysteine checked, and it will wake you up. And I had a woman years and years ago when I was training at the MAC, super fit, 50-year-old woman. And I knew, you know, she came to see me because she was concerned about heart disease in her family, and I got her homocysteine. It was 34. Ooh, yeah. She had a heart attack two years later. Yeah. After the second session, when I, we got into her blood work and talk about food and everything else, she didn't want to come back because I was trying to recommend eating some fruit, eating some ancient grains, you know, eating some real carbohydrates in her diet because she didn't ha- eat any carbs. What was her diet? Do you remember? Just a high protein diet. Oh, a lot of protein powder. Yeah, just maybe uh, you know protein powders and mm. meat and you know maybe a salad here and there, yeah. but not hardly any carbs. Focus mostly on protein at the time. Um, this is before the keto, you know, era came back Blew in. Up. But yeah, yeah it just it just and again she I wasn't saying you need to eat you know Cheetos and Doritos and Snickers bars. I was right. just saying some eat some real food. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. She didn't want to hear that because she was very lean looking, very fit looking, but you know, it was working for her mm-hmm. in her mind, but her mind. But in her the body, inside, right. Yeah. And, and, and again, working. so you'll see that in your skin and your hair and everything else that goes with it. But homocysteine is a number that you need to make sure you get it checked and you won't get it checked unless you ask for it. Man. Maybe and then from here underneath that, <laughs> It's called high, highly sensitive c reactive protein. Now, what is that? That is an inflammation marker. So with COVID for the last handful of years, we need to know this number. And ideally, you want that number less than one. So if that number starts creeping up two, three, four, and above, we've got lots of chronic inflammation. Hmm. So this, this tells us if our body is in inflammation. Lots of inflammation. Mm-hmm. Okay. It's, and again, you might see this if you bang your knee or you get a bee sting or things like that but you're going to notice this right now is it chronic or is it you know just a acute and again that number needs to be ideally less than one i really like to see it at 0.058 or 0.07 or something like that but i want it under one okay so when you consume antioxidant foods you consume anti-inflammatory foods you know, basically eating real food, again, back to your omega-3 fats, the, the cod liver oil, the flax, the chia, walnuts, turmeric, um, dark frozen cherries. That's why, you know, I put it in the oatmeal a lot because, again, yeah. it's an anti-inflammatory. Mm. This helps lower that number. And so when you put these two together, this is a real predictor of heart disease. Mm. So when you put what? Homeless, the, um, yeah, when you look at heart disease, it's really, I look at the three-prong approach. Is your cholesterol out of balance? Okay. Is your homocysteine too high? 
And is your high sens highly sensitive CRP too, too high? And that's the trifecta. And so when you look at this, you know, as I mentioned earlier, you know, 60 to 70% of all heart attacks occur with normal cholesterol levels. What's causing it? It's caused by too much oxidation and inflammation. A the inflammation is really a root cause of most diseases. So you think, is that what causes the blood vessels in your body to plaque? Or? It, could, it could be. So again, when you look at, you know, platelet aggregation, the stickiness and things like that, you can measure that. And a big part of that is omega-3s. It kind of makes your, you know, vessels like almost, you know, more... It makes the almost thinner. You yeah. Know? So that's why sometimes when you have surgeries, they don't want you taking any omega three fat. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about from a food. We're not talking about from a you know peel or something. Yeah, like. a lot of a lot of supplementation here. Yeah. So, but the the segment in this right now is most people are not aware of homocysteine number one, right, or highly sensitive C C reactive protein, and you need to ask for that. And again, it's back on the know your numbers. So, mm. but it, it's interesting to me. Or when I speak to organizations and they're in this space, they don't really know much about this test and there's no blood work for it. So we're going to get to this in a little bit at the end, but you need to ask for these tests. Yeah. And you're the customer, you're the consumer um, to make sure you get this. And then from there, we go into prostate. And so I tell, I don't know if you ever heard this, but the three things that grow on men the rest of your life are your, your nose, your ears, and your prostate. So our <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> prostate gets gross as we age. Uh -huh. And so it looks like an M. And mm -hmm. so when a, a doctor physically checks your prostate, especially when you hit 50, yeah. they're looking for the space between the M's. That's that, And they know it's growing. So, mm -hmm. And then you, get, you can get your blood work, which is, again, your PSA. So these are just a couple preventative. And I'm a huge fan of you know, making sure you get your prostate physically checked for men mm -hmm. and making sure you're getting a colonoscopy once you hit 50 or 45, especially if you have any history. I have history in my family. Both my father and my grandfather had colon cancer. Really? And so I got my colonoscopy, you know, when I was 45, and I get it every five years. So it's a really easy preventative um, diagnostics for, for, you know, men and women. Yeah. But, again, it kind of goes along with the prostate. You want to get it get it checked so you're getting ahead of the game yeah and i think that's the point of all this is we're trying to create awareness mm -hmm. that because sometimes we don't know and the body's talking to you that's one side of the equation but then you have your blood work on the other side of the equation it's good to to get these baseline numbers so now you can compare them year after year yeah. so if you got your homocysteine one year and it was at let's say 10 and the next year it's at eight you know you're hovering in a great spot yeah. But if you get it one year and it's at eight and the next year it's at 16, yeah. you're doing something. Yeah, something so off. Something's off. And that creates that awareness like, hey, let, let's buckle down here. Yeah. But that's the thyroid. And then you go, or in the, the prostate, and then you go into the thyroid for both men and women. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you think about the United States, I don't know if you've ever heard much about this, but we have the more challenges with thyroid than any country in the world. Uh, yeah, I've looked into that. That's very true. And I look at this here. This is a, I call this a pace disease. Hmm. Our pace of our life is too fast. You think so? Do you think thyroid has a lot to do with stress? Thyroid is directly related to stress. Wow, okay. It's a stress indicator. So your adrenals you know, are part of the whole system. And if the adrenals get smoked, and again, you're seeing changes in that, but you really want to make sure that if your thyroid does get a little bit out of balance, mm -hmm. you know, step one is making sure what your sleep look like, what's your pace of your li life look like, yep. do you have enough space in your life to handle the pace? And so to me, when I look at both men and women, everybody used to think this is for women only, but it's for both men and women, they need to look at that space and pace of their life. Mm -hmm. and are they getting enough rest? And if you're not getting enough rest, you're going to see this thing out of whack. Gotcha. And then on top of that, you could add foods high in iodine and sea vegetables. And there's lots of tools we have in our books and things along the way. Is but that, today, is that to get it lower? Or? To, to improve that, yeah, to create a little more balance okay. yeah, for that. So you want, you need... So step one is when you think of thyroid is you need to get more rest, and then you start rest. looking at what foods are you know, high in iodine that can help that. Gotcha. But cool. again, in this... In this podcast today, I don't want to make this thing five hours long. <laughs> right, right. You go I, probably go down a loop. We can go down and really and go every detail yeah. with this. We're just trying to say, okay, if you're just create this awareness today, get these numbers, understand them, and then we can talk about improving them. That's going to be that's going to be podcast number three. 
All right, y'all got to tune in. So that's going to be coming up. We're going to talk about not only what they are, but we're going to talk about what to do about it. So okay. today's more awareness and looking at kind of some of that stuff. Cool. And then from here, some of my favorites as we get closer to the end here. But vitamin D. You talk a lot about vitamin D. I do. And one of the greatest ways to get vitamin D? Sun. Sun. Sunlight. Yep. So, and when's the best time to get sun? In the morning. In the morning. Yeah. Right? So morning yep. sunlight is ideal to help vitamin D. D. And the other thing, too, the raised vitamin D is what we're so proud of is our cod liver oil. Yeah. And what makes our cod liver oil unique, number one, it's the highest source of vitamin D in a food form besides the sun. Mm. But the livers are frozen on the boat in Dutch Harbor, Alaska, which creates high levels of D3 naturally. So we don't have to add the D3 back to that. So if you're out there taking D3, you don't have to take D3 anymore because you get it in the cod liver oil. So if yep. you take the cod liver oil, which is your omega-3 fat, you're getting uh, all sorts of wonderful things for your brain health, heart health, natural anti-inflammatory, which, again, we talked about, you know, highly sensitive CRP. But now we got the vitamin D. Boom. Easy. Easy. No man. brainer. <laughs> so that cool. and again, you want that number. Ideally, you want your vitamin D level to be over 50. And one little caveat here is when you get your blood test, especially when you're in the, the Midwest or northern states, you want to make sure your blood test, you get that at different times of the year. So if I get my blood test, you get your blood test in, let's just say, February or March, mm -hmm. going through winter, not a lot of sun here. Okay. We're going to probably have lower vitamin D levels versus if I get my blood test in August. So to me, when I'm getting my physical, I try to, get, I try to stagger that. One year I get it in maybe February. The next year I might get it in August, and I just okay. compare apples to apples. Okay, gotcha. And that will help looking at your vitamin D. And then one of my most favorite blood tests of all is testosterone for both men and women. Mm. So if you're taking notes out there, understanding that testosterone is the, one of the greatest predictors of how you're aging. Am I thriving or am I just surviving? Mm. And so for women, ideally, you want to see testosterone over 30. This is total testosterone. And for men, I like to see it over 500. So at 25, I'd really like to see your testosterone level probably eight, nine, you know, a thousand. <laughs> With is over a thousand. Because is, is that even possible? Or? Perfect. Yeah. Oh, it's possible. Be. Yeah. Okay. Now, if it's way up there, then if you're like taking something. <laughs> so, so when I hear this sometimes, and I get guys, and they're taking now they're taking, taking testosterone replacement yeah, therapy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, holy crap, you know? Hey, what and you like, doing, man? You're what are you doing? 8, 000, man. But it's a little bit too high. Yeah, yeah. And they can't get. It's hard to balance. So to uh, me, you know, hormone replacement therapy could fit, but I'm not a believer of that, especially at the beginning. Yeah. There's so many wonderful ways you improve your testosterone level, and step one with testosterone is understanding how the nervous system works mm. and how cholesterol, cholesterol makes building sex hormones and cholesterol makes stress hormones. Mm -hmm. But if your stress hormones are on, they're called survival hormones. The cortisol, that's not gone. It's that is going to take precedent and that's yep. going to steal from your testosterone. So even though you take bioidentical hormones many times, you're still not getting where you want to be because you're always constantly stealing from your stress hormones. So to yeah. me, step one, when you think of testosterone is, you want to get more rest. Yeah. So years ago, I'm probably, I think probably 10 years ago, and I'm just crushing it. I'm out there on the road. I'm speaking all the time. I mean, mm -hmm. life is good. And I come back, and I get my blood test back, and my testosterone level dropped 200 points, my total testosterone. I'm thinking, what's going on? It's crazy. I'm eating great. I'm working out great. You know, I'm thinking I'm doing all this stuff. I'm sleeping. I'm doing all this stuff. Mm. And I sit down with my son, Matt. Matt goes, Dad, you don't get it, do you? I go, well, I don't, mean, well, I don't know what you're talking about. He goes, you're not getting enough rest. Nope. He goes, you're traveling too much. You're gone 21 to straight days on the road. You're gone 18 straight days on the road. Mm -hmm. This ain't working for you. And I go, you know what? You're right. Because when I'm on the road, I don't sleep the same. You know, I'm in a different bed, different time zone, different whatever. And so we came back and we said, you know what? If you go out on the road for four days, you need to come back for two or three. Sleep, if you're going out in four <laughs> days, you need to come back and rest. So you weren't stringing me out. On the I remember one time I was in seven states in six days. That is crazy. I don't even know. I, I get up in the morning. I have no plane. idea what floor I'm on, what hotel I'm in. I have no idea. I have to look at my card because I have no idea where I was. Wow. So then it realized, hit me that I needed more rest. And when I did that, 
my testosterone level came back. So if you don't know know your baseline, yeah, you don't know if you're. And if I didn't know my baseline, I would have never known. Right. I would have never known I needed more. I didn't. I needed to work less. Well, what is your baseline though? What would you call your baseline? My baseline probably right now is probably seven fifty. Seven fifty. Yeah. How do How would you know? Like you know, someone who don't normally do tests or know about that. How would you know? You wouldn't know. Your what your baseline is. You got to just. You got to go get it. Yeah. Year. So, so one of the things I think you and I talked way back in the day, if I could go back in time, I would do all these blood tests when I'm 20 Mm. and I would be able to compare. I'd love to see like right now, get your, you know, you have your testosterone, you need to have it checked every year. But if you go back at your 25 and you're now you're 55 and you look back, you go, that's Rashawn's normal level, you know? Mm -hmm. And so when I sit down with clients you know, everybody has genetic tendencies. They might be a little higher in this, lower in this, but now they know consistently where you're at. Yeah. And so my testosterone hovers, you know, 750, 800, right in that range. If it dropped to 500, I would lose my mind. Like, what am I doing wrong? I'm not getting enough rest. Yeah. Uh-huh. I see so many young men today in their 30s, early 40s, 250, 300 testosterone. Oh, man. And I'm like, wow. I, and I, as soon as I talked, you know, like I'll get a question, Hey, what, you know, what your T, what your t- total testosterone should be. It should be when you're 25, 30, 40, it should be six, seven, eight, 900. Mm. That's normal. You're thriving. Mm. And as time goes on, we lose testosterone about 1% a year. So in a matter of two, three decades, Man, you can lose 20, 30 percent of your testosterone level. It's crazy. So for both men and men and women. So again, for it's not a man thing. It's a both men and women, and it's an it's understanding how you're aging, how you're thriving. I, and I, I would like to know this too. Like, how how would it benefit a woman to have normal testosterone? You're gonna have a better. Uh, skin tone, you're going to have better muscle, you're going to have better energy, you're going to have mm. better recovery, you're going to be- have better libido, you're going to have mm. everything's better mm. because it's you're building your sex hormone. Yeah. So as we age, mm-hmm. you know, and that's why omega 3 fats and omega 6 fats are so essential. That's the raw material. And then you get in selenium and zinc. So I'm a huge fan of selenium and zinc, Brazil nuts, pumpkin seeds. These are all ways to help your testosterone levels and mm. improve your cholesterol profiles, and the list goes on. So again, first thing I look at when I'm working with testosterone, we got to look at recovery and rest, because in sleep, stage three of sleep is when testosterone's made. Gotcha. So if you're not a sleeper, you're not going to see that. Wow. So that's the building, and that's the thriving hormone. So to me, you can get into cortisol measurements and things like that, but if testosterone's good, generally cortisol is going to be good. So we don't have to get crazy with testing. We just have to create that awareness. And now at age 25, you have your baseline. Mm -hmm. And then when you're 30 and 35, you have more. So again, you can share that with your family and friends and whatever. So all my friends, I'm like, hey, what's your T level? They're like, I don't know. And then they're watching some, you know, ex-sports guy talking about, you know, Testafin and, you know, ageless male and all these stupid things on, you know, that are advertised. And, 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 And it's geared mostly for men. Mm-hmm. But it's really a men and women, but it's not, that's not the answer. The answer is lifestyle, recovery, how I eat, strength training. That's the marker. Yeah. But as we age, that number I'm seeing, I've never seen such low testosterone levels for both men and women. It's crazy. They're just so low, and they're like, my doctor says that's normal. Well, the range says 250 <laughs> and above. But that's not normal. Right. That's normal in our society, but that's not thriving. That's feeling crummy. My right. energy levels, too much body fat, the list goes on and I on. I call so, that zombie mode. Zombie mode. Zombie mode. I'm just functioning, but I'm not thriving. Yep. So from there, we move into a kidney function. Mm, and this is called glomular filtration rate, or GFR. And I was asking this question yesterday. How many dialysis clinics are in this community today? And today there's five in our community. Hmm. And five years ago, there was one. Hmm. So you got to ask the question around the country, why do we have all these dialysis clinics? Why do we have all these kidney problems? Hmm. It's what we're doing. Too much alcohol, too much caffeine, too many energy drinks, you know, too much protein powder. 
because protein powder has put a lot of stress in the kidneys because it's an isolate. Mm. You know, it's like putting sand in a radiator. So are you drinking enough water? It's all the above, and now you're seeing kidney things. And then one of the things, I had a woman that was at a GFR, and ideally you want to see your GFR above 60, mm -hmm. but that's not even thriving. Your doctor won't even bring it up unless it drops below 60. So mm. the point when you're getting your glomerular filtration or your GFR, which is on your Know Your Numbers, is you want to know the exact number. So if I said, hey, Rashawn, at 25, I bet your GFR is probably 110 to 120. If it was 70, I'd go, Rashawn, do you ever drink water? Yeah, what's going on? What's going on? Something's yeah. not right. Yeah. So you want to know the exact number. And I had a woman that was 42 in her early, mid-60s, and she raised it up to over 60 hmm. because we just changed – Started drinking a lot more water, less coffee, added chlorophyll to her diet, you know, the wheatgrass, the list goes on, yeah. and cleaned out her radiator. What was it originally? It was 42. Mm. I mean, at 42, when, I came, when she came to see me, because that's why their doctor sent her to me, Okay. because her GFR was 42. And then I had one guy, he was in the early, I think he was in the low 40s, and he was drinking like 30 mixed drinks over a weekend. Oh, man. On average. Oh, man. <laughs> so it was excessive alcohol to drop his GFR. And he didn't tell me that the first session, but finally the, after the second session, he says, this is what we're doing. I go, I'm not your alcohol police here, but it, it's good. you can't be doing that. So what really breaks down your kidney function is dehydration, mm. alcohol, soda pop, energy drinks, protein powder. And so you can see the perfect storm going out in our world today. Yeah. So if, if someone was, like, excessively drinking coffee and, like, drinking a little bit of water, right, would that be a big effect for their kidney? Like, would it affect their kidney in the long For sure. Run? Even being young. Yeah. Okay. Because what you're doing is you're, you're making the kidneys work too hard. Mm. So think of the kidneys as, like, a radiator. You want to make the kidneys really flush it, clean it. You're moving your body. You're eating healthy foods to help eliminate correctly. We talked about elimination of the bulls. Yeah. But when you're staying hydrated and chlorophyll, chlorophyll is a natural detoxifier. Yeah. You put those two together, and now you start seeing better kidney functions. Gotcha. And if you go to any of the big you know, big box stores, you see protein powders everywhere. Yeah, they everywhere. For and sure. so I'm not trying to beat up protein powder, but protein powders are really tough in the kidneys. So to me, I always ask the question, why do I need protein powder? I mean, I've competed in 10 bodybuilding contests. I haven't used a protein powder in 20 years. Wow. And so if I'm adding more protein to like a smoothie – I'm just going to use our smoothie blend, or I'm going to use nuts and seeds. It's easy. It's not hard. And I'm getting more and more, you know, but it's yeah. coming from the source mm -hmm. versus in a powder form that's going to be very tough for my body to break down. So you, do you think your body, like, does it, when you when it comes from the source, is your body able to use that it and just build knows muscle how to, more? It knows how to handle to it, yeah. So if I mm -hmm. gave you, let's just say, you know, protein powder, and you added water to it, what would happen to it? Just yeah. protein powder and a little bit of water. It start like clumping up a it little bit. Clumps up. It's like mud. Yeah. Well, okay. There you go. That's mm. kind of what it does to the kidneys. So you can wow. see, it's not saying you can't have it occasionally, but I'm seeing the excessiveness. Yeah, two hundred grams. Two hundred grams a day, yeah. or you know, I'm doing two scoops in a drink twice a day. I'm like, whoa, wait a minute, why? Slow down, right? right yeah. Why do I need this excessive protein? I don't. I mm. just need to eat real food. Mm -hmm. So when I eat real food, besides fruit, everything has some form of protein in it. Our oatmeal that we make in the morning, that has like 15 grams to 20 grams of protein without any meat, just nuts in the, in the oats. Mm. You know, it's not hard to do. So that's sometimes I ask the question, why do gotcha. I want to put my kidneys in harm's way when I don't need to? Gotcha. Man. Yeah. So that, again, that's the GFR. And then the last couple here is body weight. And so I was having this conversation with a woman yesterday, and she said she wanted to lose... 10 to 15 pounds. And so we got into why she wanted to lose weight and whatever. But I said, you know, have you ever heard of this thing called the whistle? She said, no, I've never heard of that. I said, well, I really like to use the word, the, uh, the term whistle. Mm. A whistle is a number that once you approach that number, the whistle comes out. It's time to get busy. So if I, hey, Rashawn, what, how much do you weigh? Uh, last time I checked, I was 201. So 201. So what do you like to weigh? I like to weigh, fluctuate from around you know, 195 to 205, 
run at your so again that's your that's your range i mm-hmm. love that so 195 to 205 mm-hmm. it what ha- what would happen if you get to be 206 then i'm like okay let me here's the whistle yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay whistle the little flag gonna play so whistle comes out yeah. to play you know so mm-hmm. for me when i hit 180 wait a minute what, what what's going on here mm-hmm. i mean you know i'm not i'm not I'm not staying. I'm not being intentional about that. Mm-hmm. So I think everybody, when you think of your body weight, find a space that you can sustain, mm-hmm. and it, you can have some wiggle room. But once you hit that high number, whatever that number might be for you, that's the whistle, and then you need to get more intentional to bring it back in. Because we all know. Imagine, let's say, for example, you. Your whistle. You're in 195 to 205. Your whistle is 206, right? What if you weighed 246? <laughs> the whistle didn't b- been blown on for like a minute. <laughs> so so you know once you start going and you're not you don't have the whistle, yeah. It's really hard to come back and that's yep. what we're seeing in our world today mm-hmm. that if you ask people what do they weigh, most people don't have any idea. Mm-hmm. They they guess. Mm-hmm. Uh mm. I don't know, something. Right. And so when I talk to, you know, people I'm like how much do you weigh? They're like, I don't know, probably 240, 250. And then they weigh themselves 268. What? How does that happen? Well, you have no whistle. You have no mm-hmm. range. Mm-hmm. So wherever you are with the body weight, don't get crazy with it. You don't need to weigh yourself every day. But you need to have some way to monitor that. Yep. And this is nothing new with blood work. But whether it's a belt, a pair of pants, the mirror, it doesn't lie. Right. right? <laughs> so it's always a good idea to find something like that. And then that's the whistle. Like, get a pair. Of, like, sometimes I'll put my pants on. I'm like, what the hell? My pants are tight today. What mm. the hell's going on? <laughs> yeah. Then I know I need to get busy. Yep. You know, the holidays have been, I'm like, okay, time to go. Time Eat to get too going. Good. Yep. Too good. Mm-hmm. Had a really good time over the holidays. Time to get busy. So yeah. anyway, body weight's a great indicator. Your body's talking back to you. Nothing to have to do with your blood work. And the last two, last little piece here is I call it the big three. Again, it's at the bottom of our handout. Like, nothing to do with blood work. Mm-hmm. But these are really great indicators. How many breaths do you take per minute? Mm. Resting heart rate and your blood pressure. Mm. And I always tell people, if you can really work on your breath, breathe through the nose, use the diaphragm, slow it down, and you do that consistently, you will become more of a normal diaphragmatic nasal slow breather. This mm. It's going to happen. Because the average person in the United States breathes about 22 breaths per minute. Is that good or bad? That's bad. Oh, wow. Ideally, probably for you, you're probably averaging anywhere between 12 and 14 breaths over the period of 24 hours. So if you get intentional about your breath, four-second inhalation, six-second exhalation, that's Mm -hmm. one example, then that's going to give you six breaths or less per minute. You start practicing that. And that's going to be more of your norm. And now I'm going to start using my diaphragm. I'm going to slow things down and get more oxygen exchange. Yeah. Yep. And that's a skill. And most people breathe way too much through their mouth. Yep. So when I'm working out, even most of the time, I try to breathe only through my nose unless it gets too intense. Mm-hmm. But as your breath goes, so does your heart rate. Mm. Because it's the fastest way to calm the mind and relax the body. So resting heart rate is a great indicator of fitness level. And oh. I really like to see resting heart rate of under 60 ideally Sheesh. okay average in the united states is closer to 75 Sheesh. so if you back up and look at breasts per minute ideally you want to see most people 24 7 anywhere breast between 12 and 16 breasts throughout the day per minute or do yep I, okay. per minute and okay. then you're going to be intentional about working on that maybe a minute or two here and there where you're getting it down one of the exercises i love to do with my clients especially when we get into more regular training yeah is do a three minute breath uh, basically exercise and you can fake it for one minute, but for three minutes, it's really hard to fake your breathing. You can't. So as you get better at it, I try to get my clients to do 15 breaths mm. or less in three minutes. That's bringing it down. Yeah. It's bringing it down. All the and way. I got to tell you, when you do that, it's like the chill pill. Now you're teaching your body, the skill to balance your nervous system, calm the mind, relax the body. That's the skill. Hmm. And if you can do that regularly, I don't even need to look at your blood work. I know everything's probably going to be pretty, pretty, pretty good by yeah. just changing that. And well, when you do that, your resting heart rate's going to naturally come down. And as your fitness level gets better, your stroke volume gets better, which is your contraction of the heart, and that drops your resting heart rate. That's why people, when they get more fit, they have a lower resting heart rate because they have a stro- higher stroke volume 
which allows that to go down. So again, gotcha. that's these are great indicators. And then if you're a diaphragmatic slow breather, breathing through the nose, blood pressure is a thing of the past. You're not going to have blood pressure problems. Because when you th see high blood pressure, it means the nervous system is being more stimulated 99% mm. of the time. So if someone, let's say this, like someone has a lot of stress and they breathe a lot, like very fast, or um, what is that called? The blood pressure is going to be higher? The blood pressure is going to be higher. Gotcha. So blood pressure, again, is an imbalanced nervous system. So imagine this. You, you teach the skill of the breath. Mm. And you get a little bit of movement regularly, and you're doing you know better stuff. You're gonna have yeah. a lower resting heart rate. That's a great indicator of all the wearables today. Mm -hmm. And then you you know your blood pressure is gonna be back in normal. And so sometimes when people see you know like it's called bradycardic. Bradycardic means your heart rate's less than sixty. So I just had my colonoscopy done two weeks ago. So I come in there, and you know Gail's talking to me, and I get in there, and I'm all hooked up. I'm gonna s slow down my breathing again. She says, "Is you?" Is your resting heart rate always right around 43, 42? I'm like, yep. Mm. And then I try to lower it. So then I'm trying to lower it even more. And she said, are you symptomatic? Do you have any symptoms? I'm like, no. Mm -hmm. She goes, your blood pressure is right now hovering between 100 and over 60. Is that symptomatic? I'm like, no. She goes, wow. that's fantastic. She said, I don't really see 65-year-olds coming in here with no medication. And, you know, like, well, I'm, you know, and then she says, what do you do? <laughs> and I said, well, this is kind of what we do. Here, but take my book. <laughs> so here's my book. <laughs> but the point of this for everybody, everybody yeah. can approve this. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't cost a dime. But you just takes the intentional practice of changing your breathing. Dr. Phil Nuremberger taught me this, you know, over 15 years ago. I'm like, and I remember when I first met him, he says, you know, I think you breathe too much through your chest. Mm. First time I met him, I, I go, who is this guy? And he goes, and you breathe too much through your mouth. And I was doing everything wrong. I was breathing through much to my chest. I, was, I never really was taught much about breath. I mean, in exercise physiology, nobody ever talked about, you know, breathing, how to breathe. Wow, I mean, great. it's only been around for centuries, right? But yeah. again, it's actually a skill you're taught. And then I started practicing and I'm like, wow, this is gold. And everything improved. So that's where the big three come in. And so make sure that when you're getting your Know Your Numbers handout, you're doing that. And as we wrap this up, I want to talk one last thing about conversing with your health professional. So when, when's the next time you're going to get a physical? Um, honestly, I'm going to have to schedule one ASAP. Okay. I want to know about this test. I want to see everything. I'm going to come back to you with it, too, because we can talk about it, but um, probably so, within the next month. Yeah, so so the first thing is is you need to find a, a health professional in your community mm -hmm. that you have a good relationship with. And remember, this is a relationship. So an average doctor visit, average, and again, I'm not trying to beat anybody up. I used to work for Dr. Barry Saltman. The guy was an amazing human being. But the average doctor visit is about 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, we had Jill Marlin on here. We talked about visits. The average cost of a, uh, a visit is usually around $230. Most people don't see that because insurance pays for it. But with that being said, you want to be having a great relationship. So it's a back-and-forth relationship. And I always tell all my clients is this. What are the top three things you want to ask your doctor? Hmm. And you need to go in there with that. Because if you don't go in there with that plan, they're going to basically do what they need to do. Standard. Yeah, and the yeah. other thing, too, in, in support in the, in the medical world and the you know, health professionals is that many times people are not going to be compliant. Even though they tell you this, they're not going to actually do that. So in their side, if they only have so much time with you, they're going to try to protect you, and many times that's going to be medications. Yeah. So if you come in there with high blood pressure and broken sleep and cholesterol's out of balance, you can see in a 12-minute visit, I don't know how I'm going to fix this. And number two, I don't know if you're going to do what I'm going to tell you anyway. Or, or get, So you have to get in that game. So number one is get in the game, go in with your three questions, create a relationship. If you are asked to be put on a medication, you're – Always your answer is going to be, or your ask is going to be, so what's our strategy to get off the medication? Hmm. What's our strategy to get off the medication? So if I need to be yeah, on a medication a short term, I get it. They may can fit a need. But what is my strategy to get off the medication? Work with your doctor. Have your doctor work with you. Make sure you get these tests. Ask for these tests. If you don't get these tests, then you, you're the customer. You can go find somebody else. Exactly. And that's what I hear every day. I'm like, hey, what doctor would you recommend in our community? Yeah. 
And so I'm always sending them out to this therapist, this chiropractor, this you know family practice doc, this surgeon, this whatever, because you're trying to create this network along the time. So if, if you don't have that in your community, look for it. You can find it. Mm-hmm. And if you have any questions about that, reach out to us. But again, you are the customer. You need to understand what your risk is. Mm-hmm. Again, Know Your Numbers is a great place to start. Again, our book, Rust Eat Move Book, is another resource. We have a podcast that comes out every week. Yeah, um, anything else you want to mention or say? I know I've been doing most of the talking here. I mean, but I'm, I'm, I'm soaking up like a sponge. Like, I'm getting all this info. Um, to the people, if y'all see, like what he said, asking a question, I feel like it's very important because like, me being younger, like when I was younger, I would typically wouldn't ask the doctor this stuff. I would no. be a little, no, I would be good. like, I'm doing too much. You know, yeah. I feel like I'm like, oh, well, he knows what he's doing. You're right, though. Our health is our number one asset, and I feel like, you know, if people, they don't throw it at you, you got to throw it at them. Yeah, and again, I, I, and I always say this, too. If you go in and prepare to have a really nice, you know, you're prepared to going into your meeting, yeah. you're going to have a great dialogue most of the time with your health professional. Mm-hmm. So it's not fair to your health professional to come in, they're not prepared, mm-hmm. think they're going to fix you in two seconds. Not going to happen. They're going to medicate you if you're not going to be compliant. So it needs to be that, you know, I always talk about that, you know, uh, let's make a deal. Monty Hall had the three doors. Yeah. You know, if you got a choice between door number one, two, and three, and door number one means you do not have to change a thing, that would be if I'm a doctor, I'd have three doors right there in the in the room. Yeah. Tell me what door you want to go down. Because <laughs> if you don't want to go down where you don't have to do anything, then I'm going to probably have to medicate you. Yep. Door number two is something in between, and door number three, you know, I'm all in. Okay, that's the case. You're all in. So let's go down that path. So, again, today is more awareness. Your body's talking to you. We talked about that earlier, decoding your health. Then we get into know your numbers. And our last one we're going to talk about, our next podcast, we're going to get into not only knowing your numbers. We'll do a quick review, but we're going to talk about improving your numbers, how to thrive versus just survive. So if you have any questions, we're happy to help you. Reach out to us at ontargetliving.com. Again, thanks, Rashawn, for spending some time with me today. And um, I hope you learned a couple things today, and we're happy to help you. And remember this, you have the power to feel your best. We'll see you next time.